Hey everyone, this is Kane Frequency here, and today I want to talk about the iPhone 14 Pro Max. And it has been a month since I've actually been using it as my daily driver, apart from my S22 Ultra, and I have some thoughts about it. There are things that I like about it and things that I don't. And most of it kind of stems from the fact that it doesn't really do much to change what the iPhone was from years prior. Yeah, there are some iterative improvements on the software and a little bit on the hardware side, but I don't think it brings enough of a meaningful change to actually be like, hey, I'm gonna jump out and go purchase this next iPhone. I didn't really think this version of the iPhone would be the one where I'm just like, okay, this is it. But I did think that they brought at least a few changes from the past models that would have given it a little bit of that extra life that it needed to be just a tad bit more interesting. And it kind of felt like it wasn't, but that's not really related to just the iPhone either. I think the same thing could be applied to Samsung too and to Google with the Pixel 7 Pro. I think that a lot of these phones for this year were just iterative models from last year. Refinement is not a bad thing, but at the same time, Sometimes it just feels like I'm reviewing the exact same phone from last year and there haven't really been that many differences apart from maybe the one or two things that they change. But apart from all that, I don't want to sit here and go through a bunch of these things that I'm trying to talk about without having to actually explain them so that way you can understand what I mean. So let's get into all that. And don't forget, if you like this video or any of the other content on my channel, don't forget to like comment and subscribe it'll really help me out a lot and if you haven't already you can follow me on twitter at km frequency 12. so with all that out of the way let's get into it so the first thing i want to talk about here is the design of the iphone and it really hasn't changed all that much from the past two or three previous models and the only differences i can tell from using it this whole time is the camera bump that now houses the new 48 megapixel sensor and the dynamic island, which takes the place of the old previous notch that they had on the last three phones. I also did notice that it's slightly heavier than the iPhone 13 Pro Max, and it is a little bit heavier than my S22 Ultra, and it actually kind of makes it feel a little bit more premium or put together. I won't bore you with a complete spec rundown because to be honest, the internals of the iPhone 14 Pro Max are literally the same as the last model with the exception of probably the main chip powering it in the A16 Bionic. Other than that, it is literally almost exactly the same down to the number. So. Repeating those again would probably just be completely redundant. Apple is really sticking to the, if it isn't broke, don't fix it mentality. And I really don't see that changing anytime soon. The addition of the dynamic island is one of the more meaningful changes on the iPhone, but I'll get to you a little bit later about why I feel like it may not have done enough to make the iPhone feel more different than what they intended it to be. Oh, and one more change that Apple decided to take was the removal of the SIM card slot, which in my opinion, I don't really think changed much or benefited anyone at all, to be honest. And for some people, it even caused more trouble because in some instances, it some people couldn't activate their iPhones with the eSIM. I even ran into an issue trying to activate my iPhone on um, my network. So I don't really see the benefit of removing the SIM card, it probably would have just been easier for me to just take my SIM card out of my S22 Ultra and just put it in my iPhone and there you go. It's how it's been done for all the rest of my phones. I don't really see the reason why they need to take it out now. When it comes to video quality, on the other hand, the iPhone 14 Pro Max couldn't be any further from the S22 Ultra. I think it takes some of the best video quality of a smartphone in general. And that's saying a lot, especially considering the fact that the S22 Ultra can do really well in some ideal conditions, specifically outside and in some good lighting, the S22 Ultra can do a fantastic job. I have some examples of that myself, but when you're using it on the inside with more artificial lighting rather than natural lighting, the iPhone can kind of be a little bit more consistent in that regard. 
it can take just as good of photos as the S22 Ultra outside. And it also is way more consistent with natural lighting than the S22 Ultra. I don't have to mess with too many of the settings in order for me to get my video looking at least somewhat perfect. Of course, I have to go afterward and make some edits so that way it looks a little bit better. But other than that, if you're just taking a straight video, I think the iPhone 14 Pro Max is the one of the best phones to do it for. When it comes to the Dynamic Island, I still think I like it decent enough. I think I'm not entirely as high on it as I was originally, but I still generally like it. I think mostly my problems with it come down to its compatibility with other apps. At this point in time, it really doesn't have any more usefulness other than using it for media controls or some system applications like maybe phone calls or using it as a timer. Other than that, it mostly just kind of sits there. It gives you a lot more use than the original design it had with the notch, um, where it really didn't have any use at all. You couldn't tap on it, you couldn't click it, you couldn't do anything with it. But for the naming Island, at least you have some interactivity that at least looks really cool and adds a little bit of some change from previous models. It definitely reminds me of the detailed and brief customization feature that sits on Samsung devices where they give you a choice on whether you want an expanded notification or you just want the brief notification. And essentially it is just a combination of that in a sense where it gives you the brief notification at first, but if you click and hold down on it, it gives you the detailed notification as well. So. I think it's just Apple's way of combining the two so that way you don't have to kind of go into the settings to turn it on or off. And like I said, it's still very nice. I just think that it loses a lot of its usefulness when it doesn't have anything attached to it like messages at this point in time. I'm pretty sure eventually they're going to add a bunch of new applications to it and probably be more used to it. Maybe if they decide to keep it, which I think they will, but I still think that even though it is a decent enough change to the iPhone, I still don't think it's enough for me to sit here and say, this is something that you need to have. It's still one of those features that if you like the look of it and you think it's cool and you want it, then sure. But other than that, once the novelty kind of wears off a little bit, it is just another hole punch in the display. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really bother me all that much. And it kind of just fades into the background, just like any other hole punch on a phone being the Galaxy S22 Ultra, the Pixel 7 Pro, or in this case, the iPhone. So now I want to talk about probably the most expansive part of the review. And the one thing that's probably going to be talked about the most, and that is iOS 16. And it's mostly because this is what you're going to be using the whole time you're using your phone of course, for obvious reasons. Now, iOS is very interesting, especially coming as an Android user. iOS is very feature rich, but I still think there are a lot of things that are missing from iOS that should technically be there even this far into its refinement. But first, I kind of want to go through a lot of the things that I like about iOS 16 in general. And that starts with its customization. Probably one of the things that I like using on my phones because it makes my phone feel as unique as it is. And the addition of the lock screen customization features are actually really good. So like I said in my last video, the addition of the fonts and the colors and the ability to use the depth effect to make your iPhone wallpaper or lock screen stand out is some welcome additions. And I think it was about time that Apple gave you the ability to make your phone feel at least somewhat different from the next person. It adds some style and customization to an OS that was mostly unchanged up until this point. Yes, they've added some like quality of life features and things that made it easier for other iPhone users to interact with other iPhone users or stick with things that are confined within their ecosystem. But this kind of pulls them a little bit outside the box into a territory that was mostly dominated by Android. I'm also a fan of Apple's continuity features when you have a number of their different devices. 
I think it's a lot better than where the S22 Ultra was at in certain circumstances, especially with app continuity where you can move from one application that you're using on one of your devices to another one of their devices. Like let's say if you have an iPhone and you have a Mac and you were trying to open up Safari on your phone, but you wanna put your phone down and then jump right into that same webpage you're looking at on your Mac. Well, you can do that. And it mostly works with a lot more apps than just internet, especially if that app exists on both iPhone and the Mac. On my S22 Ultra, the only thing that you could really do that with was mostly Samsung internet. And that was pretty much it. So let me talk about one of the things I feel like Apple is missing in features when it comes to using your phone in general. And that's default applications. And yes, I know Apple can have some default applications when it comes to using things like your web browser or the keyboard. But there's one app I'm specifically talking about that kind of brings up a little bit of issues, especially when you're trying to use the assistant. And that is maps. And bear with me because this is going to be a pretty lengthy explanation. Okay. So let's say you were trying to go to a specific location in a general area. And let's just say I'm driving on the road and I want to find the closest Walmart to me. And I want it to give me the directions to the closest Walmart to my location. On my S22 Ultra, normally what I would do is I would start up the Google Assistant and I would essentially say, start up navigation to the closest Walmart. And immediately, Google Maps would appear and I would get the directions immediately to the closest Walmart location to me. Now on Apple or the iPhone, essentially what would happen is when I would bring up my assistant, Siri in this case, to give me or start up navigation to the nearest Walmart, what I would get instead is a giant list with it next saying, which one? I'm not trying to say Walmart so much, but the problem is, is that I'm trying to accentuate the fact that you can't really use a completely hands-free experience when using maps on your iPhone, especially if you want to use Google Maps. And the funny thing is, is that most people prefer to use Google Maps than they do Apple Maps. Apart from that lengthy exposition on default applications, I feel like iOS in general is snappy. There are a lot of things on the iOS side that run just a little bit faster or more consistent than they do on Android. For instance, running Genjin Impact on my iPhone is a lot more smooth and a lot more consistent because of the optimization and because of how fast the A16 Bionic actually is. You don't really normally get to see the power of the A16 or even any of Apple's chips for the most part in their mobile devices because there's not many things that can push it that far. When you're gaming on your iPhone or if you're using any graphic intensive apps, you can really truly see the difference maker in how well the A16 performs. I can safely say that Apple still remains the top contender for battery life on pretty much any other devices and the iPhone 14 Pro Max is pretty much no different. You can easily get past a day and maybe into two days if you're not doing much browsing or if you're doing generally anything. The iPhone 14 Pro Max easily lasts over eight to nine hours screen on time, sometimes even 10 if you can get it that far with the always on display off. When I was testing with the always on display on originally, I was getting about maybe an hour and a half less than if I was actually using it with the always on display off, which is a mighty big difference. I didn't think it would be that big of a difference, but I'm pretty sure it's because the display is technically not off. It is always on. And of course, an always on display means it should be always on, but not with full color involved as well. So technically it's not doing much, but just dimming the display instead of turning all the pixels off, which OLEDs are always capable of doing. And in this case, they're not. I don't understand the reasoning for Apple choosing this way to make the always on display. I think it was just more of a way to make it look nice, but I think people just wanted to always on display to just display the time or pretty much any notifications that they have 
on their lock screen. For those of you that are trying to convert from Android to iPhone, I think you're going to be in for a pretty good experience. I think the iPhone does just enough to make it feel different from an Android device while still providing not an exact one-to-one -one experience, but similar to enough where you won't feel like you're changing too much, at least in certain aspects. If you're one of those people that are upgrading from maybe an iPhone 10 or 11 or 12, you'll be in for a pretty revolutionary experience coming from those devices to this one, especially in quality and smoothness of the operating system. As for me, I came to a point where I really was close to sticking with the iPhone, but to be honest, I really don't think that I'll be sticking with it as my daily driver for the most part. Now, there is a chance that I could end up going back to iPhone just to test it out again and see if it will sway me. But as of now, I think I'm missing a lot of those features that allow me to have more control over my phone. I think iOS and the continuity that it provides between my the iPhone and the Mac are great, but I think I'm willing to forego all those continuity features if it means I get to change or customize my phone to whatever I want it to do. So tell me what you guys think. Do you have the same experience as me? When you transferred over from Android to iPhone, do we have the same complaints? Do we have the same likes? Leave a comment below. And if you do like this video review, make sure to like and subscribe. And hopefully I will be able to get my Pixel 7 preview and or review out soon enough. And with all that out of the way, I'll see you guys in the next video.